The Battle of Dorylium took place during the First Crusade on July 1, 1097, between the Crusaders and the Seljuk Turks, near the city of Dorylium in Anatolia. The Crusaders had left Nicaea on June 26, with a deep distrust of the Byzantines, who had taken the city without their knowledge after a long siege. In order to simplify the problem of supplies, the Crusader army had split into two groups, the weaker led by Bohemond of Taranto, his nephew Tancred, Robert Kurt Hose, Robert of Flanders, and the Byzantine general Tadakshos in the vanguard, and Godfrey of Bouillon, his brother Baldwin of Boulogne, Raymond IV of Toulouse, Stephen II, and Hugh of Vermandois in the rear. On June 29, they learned that the Turks were planning an ambush near Dorylium. Bohemond noticed that his army was being shadowed by Turkish scouts. The Turkish force, consisting of Kila Yarslanai and his ally Hassan of Cappadocia, along with help from the Danish Mendids, led by the Turkish prince Danish Mendgezi, the Persians, and the Caucasian Albanians. Contemporary figures place this number between 25,000 to 30,000, more recent estimates are between 6,000 to 8,000 men. Back then numbers were mentioned absurdly high in order to give it a heroic twist, 150,000 men according to Raymond of Aguilers, which was not possible due lack of logistic support, men, and since Turks fought a hit-and-run guerrilla tactic indicating a small army. Fulcher of Chartres gives the exaggerated number of 360,000. In addition to large numbers of non-combatants, Bohemond's force probably numbered about 10,000, the majority on foot. Military figures of the time often imply perhaps several men-at-arms per night, i.e., a stated force of 500 knights is assumed to contain perhaps 1,500 men-at-arms in addition, so it seems reasonable that Bohemond had with him approximately 8,000 men-at-arms and 2,000 cavalry. On the evening of June 30, after a three-day march, Bohemond's army made camp in a meadow on the north bank of the river Thimbres, near the ruined town of Dorylium. Many scholars believe that this is the site of the modern city of Eskisahir. Battle On July 1, Bohemond's force was surrounded outside Dorylium by Kila Yarslan. Godfrey and Raymond had separated from the vanguard at Lys, and the Turkish army attacked at dawn, taking Bohemond's army, not expecting such a swift attack, entirely by surprise, shooting arrows into the camp. Bohemond's knights had quickly mounted but their sporadic counterattacks were unable to deter the Turks. The Turks were riding into camp, cutting down non-combatants and unarmoured foot soldiers, who were unable to outrun the Turkish horses and were too disoriented and panic-stricken to form lines of battle. To protect the unarmoured foot and non-combatants, Bohemond ordered his knights to dismount and form a defensive line, and with some trouble gathered the foot soldiers and the non-combatants into the centre of the camp. The women acted as water carriers throughout the battle. While this formed a battle line and sheltered the more vulnerable men at arms and non combatants, it also gave the Turks free rein to maneuver on the battlefield. The Turkish mounted archers attacked in their usual style, charging in, shooting their arrows, and quickly retreating before the crusaders could counterattack. The archers did little damage to the heavily armored knights but they inflicted heavy casualties on the horses and unarmoured foot soldiers. Bohemond had sent messengers to the other crusader army and now struggled to hold on until help arrived, and his army was being forced back to the bank of the Thimbris River. The marshy river banks protected the crusaders from mounted charge, as the ground was too soft for horses, and the armoured knights formed a circle protecting the foot soldiers and non-combatants from arrows but the Turks kept their archers constantly supplied and the sheer number of arrows was taking its toll, reportedly more than 2,000 falling to horse archers. Bohemond's knights were impetuous, although ordered to stand ground, small groups of knights would periodically break ranks and charge, only to be slaughtered or forced back as the Turkish horses fell back beyond range of their swords and arrows, while still shooting at them with arrows, killing many of the knights' horses out from under them. And although the knights' armor protected them well, the Turks called them men of iron, the sheer number of arrows meant that some would find unprotected spots and eventually, after so many hits, a knight would collapse from his wounds. Just after midday, Godfrey arrived with a force of fifty knights, fighting through the Turkish lines to reinforce Bohemond. 
Through the day small groups of reinforcements, also from Raymond, and Hugh, as well as Godfrey, arrived, some killed by the Turks, others fighting to reach Bohemond's camp. As the Crusader losses mounted, the Turks became more aggressive and the Crusader army found itself forced from the marshy banks of the river into the shallows. But the Crusaders held on, and after approximately seven hours of battle, Raymond's knights arrived, it is unclear if Raymond was with them, or if they arrived ahead of Raymond, launching a vicious surprise attack across the Turkish flank that turned them back in disarray and allowed the Crusaders to rally. The Crusaders had formed a line of battle with Bohemond, Tancred, Robert of Normandy, and Stephen on the left wing, Raymond, Robert of Flanders in the centre and Godfrey, Robert of Flanders, and Hugh on the right, and they rallied against the Turks, proclaiming Hodi omnes divits si deo placet affecti eritis, today if it pleases God you will all become rich. Although the ferocity of the Norman attack took the Turks by surprise, they were unable to dislodge the Turks until a force led by Bishop Adhemar of Le Puy, the papal legate, arrived in mid-afternoon, perhaps with Raymond in the van, moving around the battle through concealing hills and across the river, outflanking the archers on the left and surprising the Turks from the rear. Adhemar's force fell on the Turkish camp, and attacked the Turks from the rear. The Turks were terrified by the sight of their camp in flames, and by the ferocity and endurance of the knights, since the knights' armor protected them from arrows and even many sword cuts, and they promptly fled abandoning their camp and forcing Kila Yarslan to withdraw from the battlefield. Aftermath The Crusaders did indeed become rich, at least for a short time, after capturing Kila Yarslan's treasury. The Turks fled and Arslan turned to other concerns in his eastern territory. They also took the male Greek children from the region extending from Dorylium to Iconium, some of whom were sent as slaves to Persia. On the other hand the Crusaders were allowed to march virtually unopposed through Anatolia on their way to Antioch. It took almost three months to cross Anatolia in the heat of the summer, and in October they began the siege of Antioch. With the Crusader army moved onwards towards Antioch, the Emperor Alexios I achieved part of his original intent in inviting the Crusaders in the first place, the recovery of Seljuk-held imperial territories in Asia Minor. John Daukas re-established Byzantine rule in Chios, Rhodes, Smyrna, Ephesus, Sardis, and Philadelphia in 1097-1099. This success is ascribed by Alexios' daughter Anna to his policy and diplomacy, but by the Latin historians of the Crusade to his treachery and falseness.